Chapter 15 of My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass, narrated by Gregicator. Covey the Negro Breaker. List of chapter topics. Journey to My New Masters. Meditations by the Way. View of Covey's Residence. The Family. The Author's Awkwardness as a Field Hand. A Cruel Beating. Why it was given. Description of Covey. First adventure at ox driving, hairbreadth escapes, ox and man alike property, Covey's manner of proceeding to whip, hard labor better than the whip for breaking down the spirit, cunning and trickery of Covey, family worship, shocking contempt for chastity, the author broken down, great mental agitation in contrasting the freedom of the ships with his own slavery, Anguish Beyond Description The morning of the 1st of January, 1834, with its chilling wind and pinching frost, quite in harmony with the winter in my own mind, found me with my little bundle of clothing on the end of a stick swung across my shoulder on the main road, bending my way toward Covey's, whither I had been imperiously ordered by Master Thomas. The latter had been as good as his word, and had committed me, without reserve, to the mastery of Mr. Edward Covey. Eight or ten years had now passed since I had been taken from my grandmother's cabin in Tuckahoe, and these years, for the most part, I had spent in Baltimore, where, as the reader has already seen, I was treated with comparative tenderness. I was now about to sound profounder depths in slave life, the rigors of a field less tolerable than the field of battle awaited me. My new master was notorious for his fierce and savage disposition, and my only consolation in going to live with him was the certainty of finding him precisely as represented by common fame. There was neither joy in my heart nor elasticity in my step as I started in search of the tyrant's home. Starvation made me glad to leave Thomas Ald's, and the cruel lash made me dread to go to Covey's. Escape was impossible, so, heavy and sad, I paced the seven miles which separated Covey's house from St. Michael's, thinking much by the solitary way, averse to my condition. But thinking was all I could do. Like a fish in a net, allowed to play for a time, I was now drawn rapidly to the shore, secured at all points. I am, thought I, but the sport of a power which makes no account, either of my welfare or of my happiness. By a law which I can clearly comprehend, but cannot evade nor resist, I am ruthlessly snatched from the hearth of a fond grandmother and hurried away to the home of a mysterious old master, Again I am removed from there to a master in Baltimore. Thence am I snatched away to the eastern shore to be valued with the beasts of the field and with them divided and set apart for a possessor. Then I am sent back to Baltimore and by the time I have formed new attachments and have begun to hope that no more rude shocks shall touch me, A difference arises between brothers, and I am again broken up and sent to St. Michael's. And now, from the latter place, I am footing my way to the home of a new master, where, I am given to understand, that, like a wild young working animal, I am to be broken to the yoke of a bitter and lifelong bondage. With thoughts and reflections like these, I came in sight of a small wood-colored building, about a mile from the main road, which, from the description I had received at starting, I easily recognized as my new home. The Chesapeake Bay, upon the jutting banks of which the little wood-colored house was standing, white with foam, raised by the heavy northwest wind, Poplar Island, covered with a thick black pine forest, standing out amid this half-ocean, and Kent Point, stretching its sandy, desert-like shores out into the foam-crested bay, were all in sight and deepened the wild and desolate aspect of my new home. 
The good clothes I had brought with me from Baltimore were now worn thin and had not been replaced, for Master Thomas was as little careful to provide us against cold as against hunger. Met here by a north wind, sweeping through an open space of forty miles, I was glad to make any port, and, therefore, I speedily pressed on to the little wood-colored house. The family consisted of Mr. and Mrs. Covey, Miss Kemp, a broken-backed woman, a sister of Mrs. Covey, William Hughes, cousin to Edward Covey, Caroline the cook, Bill Smith, a hired man, and myself. Bill Smith, Bill Hughes, and myself were the working force of the farm, which consisted of three or four hundred acres. I was now, for the first time in my life, to be a field hand, and in my new employment I found myself even more awkward than a green country boy may be supposed to be upon his first entrance into the bewildering scenes of city life, and my awkwardness gave me much trouble. Strange and unnatural as it may seem, I had been at my new home but three days before Mr. Covey, my brother in the Methodist church, gave me a bitter foretaste of what was in reserve for me. I presume he thought that since he had but a single year in which to complete his work, the sooner he began, the better. Perhaps he thought that, by coming to blows at once, we should mutually better understand our relations. But to whatever motive, direct or indirect, the cause may be referred, I had not been in his possession three whole days before he subjected me to a most brutal chastisement. Under his heavy blows, blood flowed freely, and wails were left on my back as large as my little finger. The sores on my back from this flogging continued for weeks, for they were kept open by the rough and coarse cloth which I wore for shirting. The occasion and details of this first chapter of my experience as a field hand must be told, that the reader may see how unreasonable as well as how cruel my new master Covey was. The whole thing I found to be characteristic of the man, and I was probably treated no worse by him than scores of lads who had previously been committed to him, for reasons similar to those which induced my master to place me with him. But here are the facts connected with the affair, precisely as they occurred. On one of the coldest days of the whole month of January, 1834, I was ordered at daybreak to get a load of wood from a forest about two miles from the house. In order to perform this work, Mr. Covey gave me a pair of unbroken oxen, for it seems his breaking abilities had not been turned in this direction, and I may remark in passing that working animals in the south are seldom so well trained as in the north. In due form, and with all proper ceremony, I was introduced to this huge yoke of unbroken oxen, and was carefully told which was Buck and which was Darby, which was the in-hand and which was the off-hand ox. The master of this important ceremony was no less a person than Mr. Covey himself, and the introduction was the first of the kind I had ever had. My life, hitherto, had led me away from horned cattle, and I had no knowledge of the art of managing them. What was meant by the in-ox as against the off-ox, when both were equally fastened to one cart and under one yoke, I could not very easily divine, and the difference, implied by the names and the peculiar duties of each, were alike Greek to me. Why was not the off-ox called the in-ox? Where and what is the reason for this distinction in names when there is none in the things themselves? After initiating me into the woe, back, g, hither, the entire spoken language between oxen and driver, Mr. Covey took a rope about ten feet long and one inch thick and placed one end of it around the horns of the in-hand ox, and gave the other end to me, telling me that if the oxen started to run away, as the scamp knew they would, I must hold on to the rope and stop them. 
I need not tell anyone who is acquainted with either the strength or the disposition of an untamed ox that this order was about as unreasonable as a command to shoulder a mad bull. I had never driven oxen before, and I was as awkward as a driver as it is possible to conceive. It did not answer for me to plead ignorance to Mr. Covey. There was something in his manner that quite forbade that. He was a man to whom a slave seldom felt any disposition to speak, cold, distant, morose, with a face wearing all the marks of captious pride and malicious sternness, he repelled all advances. Covey was not a large man. He was only about five feet ten inches in height, I should think, short-necked, round shoulders, of quick and wiry motion, of thin and wolfish visage, with a pair of small greenish-gray eyes, set well back under a forehead without dignity and constantly in motion, and floating his passions rather than his thoughts in sight, but denying them utterance in words. The creature presented an appearance altogether ferocious and sinister, disagreeable and forbidding in the extreme. When he spoke, it was from the corner of his mouth and in a sort of light growl like a dog, when an attempt is made to take a bone from him. The fellow had already made me believe him even worse than he had been represented. With his directions, and without stopping to question, I started for the woods, quite anxious to perform my first exploit in driving in a creditable manner. The distance from the house to the woods gate, a full mile, I should think, was passed over with very little difficulty, for although the animals ran, I was fleet enough in the open field to keep pace with them, especially as they pulled me along at the end of the rope. But on reaching the woods, I was speedily thrown into a distressing plight. The animals took fright and started off ferociously into the woods, carrying the cart full tilt against trees, over stumps, and dashing from side to side in a manner altogether frightful. As I held the rope, I expected every moment to be crushed between the cart and the huge trees, among which they were so furiously dashing. After running thus for several minutes, my oxen were, finally, brought to a stand by a tree, against which they dashed themselves with great violence, upsetting the cart and entangling themselves among sundry young saplings. By the shock, the body of the cart was flung in one direction, and the wheels and tongue in another, and all in the greatest confusion. There I was, all alone in a thick wood, to which I was a stranger, my cart upset and shattered, my oxen entangled, wild and enraged, and I, poor soul, but a green hand, to set all this disorder right. I knew no more of oxen than the ox driver is supposed to know of wisdom. After standing a few moments surveying the damage and disorder, and not without a presentiment that this trouble would draw after it others even more distressing, I took one end of the cart body, and by an extra outlay of strength, I lifted it toward the axle tree from which it had been violently flung, and after much pulling and straining, I succeeded in getting the body of the cart in its place. This was an important step out of the difficulty, and its performance increased my courage for the work which remained to be done. The cart was provided with an axe, a tool with which I had become pretty well acquainted in the shipyard at Baltimore. With this, I cut down the saplings by which my oxen were entangled, and again pursued my journey with my heart in my mouth, lest the oxen should again take it into their senseless heads to cut up a caper. My fears were groundless. Their spree was over for the present, and the rascals now moved off as soberly as though their behavior had been natural and exemplary. On reaching the part of the forest where I had been the day before chopping wood, I filled the cart with a heavy load, as a security against another running away. But the neck of an ox is equal in strength to iron. 
it defies all ordinary burdens when excited. Tame and docile to a proverb when well trained, the ox is the most sullen and intractable of animals when but half broken to the yoke. I now saw, in my situation, several points of similarity with that of the oxen. They were property, so was I. They were to be broken, so was I. Covey was to break me, I was to break them. Break and be broken, such is life. Half the day already gone, and my face not yet homeward. It required only two days' experience and observation to teach me that such apparent waste of time would not be lightly overlooked by Covey. I therefore hurried toward home, but, on reaching the lane gate, I met with the crowning disaster for the day. This gate was a fair specimen of southern handicraft. There were two huge posts, 18 inches in diameter, rough-hued and square, and the heavy gate was so hung on one of these that it opened only about half the proper distance. On arriving here, it was necessary for me to let go the end of the rope on the horns of the in-hand ox, and now as soon as the gate was open and I let go of it to get the rope, again off went my oxen making nothing of their load, full tilt, and in doing so they caught the huge gate between the wheel and the cart body, literally crushing it to splinters, and coming only within a few inches of subjecting me to a similar crushing, for I was just in advance of the wheel when it struck the left gate post. With these two hairbreadth escapes, I thought I could successfully explain to Mr. Covey the delay and avert apprehended punishment. I was not without a faint hope of being commended for the stern resolution which I had displayed in accomplishing the difficult task, a task which, I afterwards learned, even Covey himself would not have undertaken without first driving the oxen for some time in the open field, preparatory to their going into the woods. But in this I was disappointed. On coming to him, his countenance assumed an aspect of rigid displeasure, and, as I gave him a history of the casualties of my trip, his wolfish face, with his greenish eyes, became intensely ferocious. "'Go back to the woods again,' he said, muttering something else about wasting time. I hastily obeyed, but I had not gone far on my way when I saw him coming after me. My oxen now behaved themselves with singular propriety, opposing their present conduct to my representation of their former antics. I almost wished, now that Covey was coming, they would do something in keeping with the character I had given them. But no, they had already had their spree, and they could afford now to be extra good, readily obeying my orders and seeming to understand them quite as well as I did myself. On reaching the woods, my tormentor, who seemed all the way to be remarking upon the good behavior of his oxen, came up to me and ordered me to stop the cart, accompanying the same with the threat that he would now teach me how to break gates and idle away my time when he sent me to the woods. Suiting the action to the word, Covey paced off in his own wiry fashion to a large black gum tree the young shoots of which are generally used for ox goads, they being exceedingly tough. Three of these goads, from four to six feet long, he cut off and trimmed up with his large jackknife. This done, he ordered me to take off my clothes. To this unreasonable order, I made no reply, but sternly refused to take off my clothing. If you will beat me, thought I, you shall do so over my clothes. After many threats, which made no impression on me, he rushed at me with something of the savage fierceness of a wolf, tore off the few and thinly worn clothes I had on, and proceeded to wear out, on my back, the heavy goads which he had cut from the gum tree. This flogging was the first of a series of floggings, and though very severe, it was less so than many which came after it, and these for offences far lighter than the gate-breaking. 
I remained with Mr. Covey one year. I cannot say I lived with him. And during the first six months that I was there, I was whipped, either with sticks or cowskins, every week. Aching bones and a sore back were my constant companions. Frequent as the lash was used, Mr. Covey thought less of it as a means of breaking down my spirit than that of hard and long continued labor. He worked me steadily, up to the point of my powers of endurance. From the dawn of day in the morning till the darkness was complete in the evening, I was kept at hard work in the field or the woods. At certain seasons of the year, we were all kept in the field till eleven and twelve o'clock at night. At these times, Covey would attend us in the field and urge us on with words or blows as it seemed best to him. He had in his life been an overseer, and he well understood the business of slave driving. There was no deceiving him. He knew just what a man or boy could do, and he held both to strict account. When he pleased, he would work himself, like a very Turk, making everything fly before him. It was, however, scarcely necessary for Mr. Covey to be really present in the field to have his work go on industriously. He had the faculty of making us feel that he was always present. By a series of adroitly managed surprises, which he practiced, I was prepared to expect him at any moment. His plan was never to approach the spot where his hands were at work in an open, manly, and direct manner. No thief was ever more artful in his devices than this man Covey. He would creep and crawl in ditches and gullies, hide behind stumps and bushes, and practice so much of the cunning of the serpent that Bill Smith and I, between ourselves, never called him by any other name than the snake. We fancied that in his eyes and his gait we could see a snakish resemblance. One half of his proficiency in the art of negro-breaking consisted, I should think, in this species of cunning. We were never secure. He could see us or hear us nearly all the time. He was to us behind every stump, tree, bush, and fence on the plantation. He carried this kind of trickery so far that he would sometimes mount his horse and make believe he was going to St. Michael's, and in thirty minutes afterward you might find his horse tied in the woods and the snake-like covey lying flat in the ditch with his head lifted above its edge or in a fence corner watching every movement of the slaves. I have known him walk up to us and give us special orders as to our work in advance as if he were leaving home with a view to being absent several days, and before he got halfway to the house he would avail himself of our inattention to his movements to turn short on his heels, conceal himself behind a fence corner or a tree, and watch us until the going down of the sun. Mean and contemptible as is all this, it is in keeping with the character which the life of a slaveholder is calculated to produce. There is no earthly inducement in the slave's condition to incite him to labor faithfully. The fear of punishment is the sole motive for any sort of industry with him. Knowing this fact, as the slaveholder does, and judging the slave by himself, he naturally concludes the slave will be idle whenever the cause for this fear is absent. Hence, all sorts of petty deceptions are practiced to inspire this fear. But with Mr. Covey, trickery was natural. Everything in the shape of learning or religion which he possessed was made to conform to this semi-lying propensity. He did not seem conscious that the practice had anything unmanly, base, or contemptible about it. It was a part of an important system, with him, essential to the relation of master and slave. I thought I saw, in his very religious devotions, this controlling element of his character. A long prayer at night made up for the short prayer in the morning, and few men could seem more devotional than he when he had nothing else to do. Mr. Covey was not content with the cold style of family worship adopted in these cold latitudes 
which begin and end with a simple prayer. No, the voice of praise as well as of prayer must be heard in his house, night and morning. At first, I was called upon to bear some part in these exercises, but the repeated flogging given me by Covey turned the whole thing into mockery. He was a poor singer, and mainly relied on me for raising the hymn for the family. And when I failed to do so, he was thrown into much confusion. I do not think that he ever abused me on account of these vexations. His religion was a thing altogether apart from his worldly concerns. He knew nothing of it as a holy principle, directing and controlling his daily life, making the latter conform to the requirements of the gospel. One or two facts will illustrate his character better than a volume of generalities. I have already said, or implied, that Mr. Covey was a poor man. He was, in fact, just commencing to lay the foundation of his fortune, as fortune is regarded in the slave state. The first condition of wealth and respectability there, being the ownership of human property, every nerve is strained by the poor man to obtain it, and very little regard is had to the manner of obtaining it. In pursuit of this object, pious as Mr. Covey was, he proved himself to be as unscrupulous and base as the worst of his neighbors. In the beginning, he was only able, as he said, to buy one slave, and, scandalous and shocking as is the fact, he boasted that he bought her simply as a breeder. But the worst is not told in this naked statement. This young woman, Caroline was her name, was virtually compelled by Mr. Covey to abandon herself to the object for which he had purchased her, and the result was the birth of twins at the end of the year. At this addition to his human stock, both Edward Covey and his wife, Susan, were ecstatic with joy. No one dreamed of reproaching the woman or of finding fault with the hired man, Bill Smith, the father of the children, for Mr. Covey himself had locked the two up together every night, thus inviting the result. But I will pursue this revolting subject no further. No better illustration of the unchaste and demoralizing character of slavery can be found than is furnished in the fact that this professedly Christian slaveholder, amidst all his prayers and hymns, was shamelessly and boastfully encouraging and actually compelling in his own house undisguised and unmitigated fornication as a means of increasing his human stock. I may remark here that while this fact will be read with disgust and shame at the North, it will be laughed at as smart and praiseworthy in Mr. Covey at the South, for a man is no more condemned there for buying a woman and devoting her to this life of dishonor than for buying a cow and raising stock from her. The same rules are observed with a view to increasing the number and quality of the former as of the latter. I will here reproduce what I said of my own experience in this wretched place more than ten years ago. Quote, if at any one time of my life, more than another, I was made to drink the bitterest dregs of slavery, that time was during the first six months of my stay with Mr. Covey. We were worked all weathers. It was never too hot or too cold. It could never rain, blow, snow, or hail too hard for us to work in the field. Work, work, work was scarcely more the order of the day than of the night. The longest days were too short for him, and the shortest nights were too long for him. I was somewhat unmanageable when I first went there, but a few months of this discipline tamed me. Mr. Covey succeeded in breaking me. I was broken in body, soul, and spirit. My natural elasticity was crushed. My intellect languished. The disposition to read departed. The cheerful spark that lingered about my eye died. The dark night of slavery closed in upon me, and behold a man transformed into a brute. Sunday was my only leisure time. I spent this in a sort of 
beast-like stupor between sleep and wake under some large tree. At times I would rise up. A flash of energetic freedom would dart through my soul, accompanied with a faint beam of hope that flickered for a moment and then vanished. I sank down again, mourning over my wretched condition. I was sometimes prompted to take my life and that of Covey, but was prevented by a combination of hope and fear. My sufferings on this plantation seem now like a dream rather than a stern reality. Our house stood within a few rods of the Chesapeake Bay, whose broad bosom was ever white with sails from every quarter of the habitable globe. Those beautiful vessels, robed in purest white, so delightful to the eye of freemen, were to me so many shrouded ghosts, to terrify and torment me with thoughts of my wretched condition. I have often, in the deep stillness of a summer's Sabbath, stood all alone upon the banks of that noble bay, and traced, with saddened heart and tearful eye, the countless numbers of sails moving off to the mighty ocean. The sight of these always affected me powerfully. My thoughts would compel utterance, and there, with no audience but the Almighty, I would pour out my soul's complaint in my rude way, with an apostrophe to the moving multitude of ships. You are loosed from your moorings and free. I am fast in my chains and am a slave. You move merrily before the gentle gale, and I sadly before the bloody whip. You are freedom's swift-winged angels that fly around the world. I am confined in bands of iron. Oh, that I were free! Oh, that I were on one of your gallant decks and under your protecting wing! Alas! Betwixt me and you the turbid waters roll. Go on, go on. Oh, that I could also go. Could I but swim? If I could fly? Oh, why was I born a man, of whom to make a brute? The glad ship is gone. She hides in the dim distance. I am left in the hottest hell of unending slavery. Oh, God, save me. God, deliver me. Let me be free. Is there any God? Why am I a slave? I will run away. I will not stand it. Get caught or get clear, I'll try it. I had as well die with ague as with fever. I have only one life to lose. I had as well be killed running as die standing. Only think of it, one hundred miles straight north, and I am free. Try it? Yes. God helping me, I will. It cannot be that I shall live and die a slave. I will take to the water. This very bay shall yet bear me into freedom. The steamboats steered in a northeast coast from North Point. I will do the same, and when I get to the head of the bay, I will turn my canoe adrift and walk straight through Delaware into Pennsylvania. When I get there, I shall not be required to have a pass. I will travel without being disturbed. Let but the first opportunity offer, and come what will, I am off. Meanwhile, I will try to bear up under the yoke. I am not the only slave in the world. Why should I fret? I can bear as much as any of them. Besides, I am but a boy, and all boys are bound to someone. It may be that my misery in slavery will only increase my happiness when I get free. There is a better day coming." End quote. I shall never be able to narrate the mental experience through which it was my lot to pass during my stay at Covey's. I was completely wrecked, changed and bewildered, goaded almost to madness at one time and at another reconciling myself to my wretched condition. Everything in the way of kindness which I had experienced at Baltimore all my former hopes and aspirations for usefulness in the world and the happy moments spent in the exercises of religion contrasted with my then-present lot, but increased my anguish. I suffered bodily as well as mentally. I had neither sufficient time in which to eat or to sleep except on Sundays. The overwork and the brutal chastisements of which I was the victim 
combined with that ever-gnawing and soul-devouring thought, I am a slave, a slave for life, a slave with no rational ground to hope for freedom, rendered me a living embodiment of mental and physical wretchedness 